and all present here. On behalf of Justin Lano, I welcome you all on today's session on the topic as a geoeconomics expert. Today with us, we have Dr. Bhavya. Dr. Bhavya is self given to the development and advancement of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. His passion for startups brought him to RA Poddar Institute of Management, FMS. University of Rajasthan as Assistant Professor of Entrepreneurship and Marketing in 2013. He's a registered startup mentor with Startup India Program by Government of India. He's Innovation Ambassador of University of Rajasthan at Institution Innovation Council, MOE, Government of India. He's Executive Member of Entrepreneurship and Career Hub, University of Rajasthan. He has been mentoring, consulting, and training a number of startups and family businesses in Rajasthan. He's a board member of non-profit organization. He's editor-in-chief of a peer-reviewed journal of integrated marketing communication and digital marketing. He's editorial board member of Journal Women Entrepreneurship. He writes articles for leading national Hindi and English newspapers and magazines. He has a PhD in Education Entrepreneurship, MBA in Entrepreneurship and Marketing, and MA in Economics. He's a curious researcher, star model of entrepreneurship, is being used at various education institutions as a lens to have a holistic view of entrepreneurship. He's a poet at heart. I now request Dr. Bhavya to kindly introduce to our guest, Mr. Akshay Mathur. Thank you, Abhimanyu. Thank you, entire team of Jasol Dialogue for uh, having me here. Uh, I am really honored to introduce Mr. Rakshay Mathu, Director, Observer Researcher from Observer Research Foundation and Head of ORF uh, Geoeconomics. He is a meticulous researcher, having an expertise in leading think tanks and institutions focused on policy research. He is one of the finest head and heart that we have in this country to bridge the discourse gap between government, businesses, and institutions. He is an authority in the domain of global business, global financial architecture, and international trade. He has been associated with Center for International Governance Innovation as senior fellow. He has an experience of almost two decades now working with various organizations, including Gateway House, Asia Global Institute, Fidelity Investments, to name a few. I welcome you, Akshay Ji, on behalf of all our viewers and just whole dialogue team. So, uh, to, okay. Ji, so to, to begin this conversation, uh, this word, uh, geoeconomics, is a very, uh, it, it's not a very buzzword uh, so far. So we understand what is geography, we understand a little bit of economics. What is geoeconomics? I want to understand first, Akshisha. Um, so thank you for that question and that introduction, first of all. Uh, yeah. um, and uh, so geoeconomics is a relatively new field of study in India. Mm -hmm. Around the world, it is a very established uh, field. Uh, I think uh, when we talk about geoeconomics, people uh, refer to it in different ways. Uh, sometimes international trade, sometimes they talk about international finance, they talk about international business. And um, remember there is that famous story about the elephant and everybody is trying to figure out what animal it is and somebody is holding the tail and somebody is holding the head and nobody can actually get the full picture. It's a little bit, geoeconomics is actually inclusive and all encompassing of all of these things uh, that I have just described. Uh, I think the most simplest way to put it is that it is the use of statecraft for economic means or economic ends, any kind of statecraft. It's the use of diplomacy, it is the use of statecraft for an economic objective. And I think that is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. 
happens uh, with us is that it then naturally includes international trade. It includes international finance and international financial architecture. It includes international business and global supply chains. It includes international monetary system, international monetary theory, international banking system, all of these things. Mm-hmm. Any time that the international banking system, monetary system, trading system, uh, financial system, international business and supply chains um, are the target. If any time that these are used or leveraged for our own national security goals, that is geoeconomics. So geoeconomics is really a more comprehensive area of study as opposed to these siloed approaches that we might have seen before, where people know that if they're international business, they're probably working with a multinational corporation. If they're international finance, they're probably bankers. If they're international trade, then they're probably uh, working in the commerce ministry or they're an export or import house. So I think that's the simplest way for me to explain geoeconomics. All right. Could you could you give us uh, uh, some popular incident that, which we can use as an example that, look, this is an application of geoeconomics. Uh, especially in context of India, if you could give us some examples. So look, so in the context of India, what has happened is that uh, any international economic engagement that we have done has typically uh, has typically followed two or three objectives, right? So in India, when we had to do an international economic engagement, it was either to it was either the interaction with the IMF and the World Bank Mm -hmm. is what we know. So because IMF, there was a history where we needed a lot of loans. We needed, we had a balance of payment crisis. And right from Bretton Woods institutions, uh, when it was created in 1945, India has been a member of those Bretton Woods institutions. So one example of uh, India's geoeconomic engagement is our interaction with IMF and World Bank and maybe even the WTO. We have a history of English. We have a lot of experts and expertise in the country dealing with it. Mm-hmm. After the 90s, another, another area developed and that is attracting FDI. So there is there are a lot of people in the country who know that we have to attract FDI for our development, for financing infrastructure, for getting money into our venture, uh, sorry, for getting venture capital money into our startups. Uh, um, for uh, attracting capital uh, development financing needs for our socioeconomic programs. So attracting foreign capital is very widely understood, but it is another example of geoeconomics. And I'll say a third one is uh, the work our commerce ministry and our exporters and importers do when they are trying to export to say Sri Lanka. They're trying to export uh, uh, soaps or, or detergents or cars or tractors or electrical machinery or now in the case that we do now more lately software so you have to engage with the other country you have to negotiate a trade agreement you have to work on certain tariff lines and all that is another area of a geoeconomic engagement um, in and this is partly related to your previous question of what is geoeconomics. What we are used to, as these three examples indicate, is a, is a more siloed understanding of what geoeconomics is, because these are the mm. these are the issues that we were we are used to dealing with as a country. Yeah. Geoeconomics, what it does is to even close on the first question that you asked, pulls together all of these three elements, right? So, for instance. Um, how do we engage with China, not just on in Ladakh or on the border, but that necessarily includes looking at trade, looking at what is happening in the international monetary system, uh, looking at what is happening in, in, in foreign capital, all of that in one comprehensive way. Looking at, should we engage with the United States or should we engage with Russia? Should we get capital from Europe? Should we make a trade agreement with ASEAN? All of it is looked rather comprehensively. And so uh, so in India, I think we are now only gradually beginning to look at geoeconomics in a more comprehensive way. 
mm-hmm. and uh, i think in military and in security terms uh, some of our experts even students in universities are more used to doing a more net assessment a more comprehensive picture i think in economics and finance uh, we are just starting we just start okay 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 and uh, i uh, observe and and it's a very uh, widely observed trend that uh, the world is moving that there was a point of time when there, it was a bipolar world and for a couple of decades it became almost a unipolar world and now we are talking about a multipolar world with the rise of china once again so this uh, rise of a multipolar world how do you think that affects the geo economics for the world and particularly for india so one of the things it does is that uh, well maybe i take a step back what does a multipolar world uh, what kind of what kind of change in international relations does a multipolar world uh, bring right mm-hmm. the things that uh, we are seeing is the reason why we have a multipolar world is because there are multiple uh, centers of economic vibrancy multiple centers of economic growth the rise of china is obviously one but we also have uh, japan and south korea in east asia we have asean and singapore and malaysia in southeast asia we of course have india here you have pockets of excellence in in west asia and in africa um you have still have europe uh, as as a key player in, in economics and world affairs and of course there is uh, there is the united states you also have australia uh, on the, the far east so because we have multiple sources of economic growth it automatically lends itself to more opportunities there are more players trying to influence the global economy the global the rules of the global economy as they are today if you were to look back at say britain woods or if you were to look back when say there were united states and russia the two main powers uh or united states russia and europe you would say that they actually played the key role right so you so the us and europe played a key role in setting up the bretton woods institutions they were the powers yeah. at that time since then russia has had a key influence on many such institutions and forums that were built now with the rise of china and india and mexico and turkey and korea you have other countries that are rising up to have a say in global economic affairs mm. what are the things that are important in global economic affairs for instance uh what are the new rules of taxation on digital multinationals for instance um does korea and india and china have a say what are the new rules capital can be moved from the developed countries into the developing countries how do we set those rules how do we bail out and assist the uh, developing nations in the time of this covid and post covid economic recovery it has a say in fact not only does india have a say it has some very good ideas to contribute uh, those global negotiations that are taking place some of your students may have followed that there is a re- need for revival of the wto because it has stagnated negotiations have stagnated again india australia uh, korea china they have some ideas on how they think the new version of the wto or the reform of that particular multilateral institution needs to take place so the multipolar world has lent itself to multiple centers of economic growth it means that there are influence on the global economic affairs is coming from multiple sources now and all of these nations actually have ideas and they have suggestions and they have perspectives and positions on how the global economic system should be reformed designed reengineered uh, maintained so in in recent times uh, akshay so what do you think are we uh, i look at it as a as a rubber band phenomena where we are stretched on both the ends we are on one hand we are moving towards uh, my nation first kind of policies and at the other end we want to uh, move towards globalization as well so what and, and which creates a lot of tension so overall what do you think where are we moving are, 
are we are we moving uh, towards making this world more globalized and more connected or gradually uh, whatever we had gained in last uh, couple of decades uh, uh, is there any threat to that do you see that threat yes there's certainly a threat uh, perhaps uh, there are two dimensions to to look at this one is of course if you remember there's always been a protest against globalization uh, sure. maybe some of those voices got drowned out by the private enterprise by the by the startups by so many uh, countries benefiting from globalization and emergence of a new middle class and uh, but there was some there are stark realities on the 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 narrow population that always got left out and so the process of globalization if you remember from the wto meetings in seattle and the protests that took place all the way to uh, till today they still exist and so in terms of income inequality in terms of protests against the power of multinationals uh, the uh, the unequal impact and benefits of globalization has always been there what is new or rather what has happened in the last 5 years or 10 years, now there is also a political and security considerations uh, for the united states for india for europe where globalization uh, is being is under pressure from geopolitics in other words geoeconomics is under pressure from geopolitics and you know between geopolitics and geoeconomics there's always that bit of a battle uh, geopolitics says that uh, you know uh, there are nations uh, perhaps for the united states like china even maybe for india where we need to be a little cautious um there are uh, you know we need to see how other countries are benefiting from globalization maybe there's unequal access and there's unfair play uh, mm-hmm. and 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 maybe there are security consideration of certain technologies which might give a military edge uh like if you think of artificial intelligence if you think of chips if you think of uh, technological improvements like that then there is a serious consideration where, uh, where where geopolitics is saying that perhaps it's better for like minded countries to come and uh, because because we think differently and because our systems are different uh, and that is what is new Uh, so is there a strain and a pressure on globalization certainly mm-hmm. will it benefit if only certain like minded countries came together and created a little network on themselves for now it seems that kind of a plurilateral approach seems to be the approach that everybody is taking uh, and it seems to be the only way forward uh, there are certain areas in which uh, there are global negotiations taking place like climate change on for instance where there are still global discussion there it is not entire it's not fractured mm. really but in most other cases when it comes to trade agreements or supply chains i think you're seeing pockets of uh, uh, the globalization fragment into pockets and mm. i think that pattern is here to stay okay 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 and and because uh, many of our audience uh they are their students right now they either in their undergraduate courses or postgraduate courses so uh, as, as you are heading the uh, geoeconomics department for oarf um uh, two things that i want to ask you from the point of view of all these students who are there with us in the audience that uh, if let's say i want to make my career uh, as an expert and i want to um, follow your footsteps and get make my career into geo economics and uh, uh consultancy and expertise in this particular area one how i should be preparing myself during my student year to you know to make myself uh, capable for for this kind of job and then second uh what kind of jobs are available in the market with somebody who has some capability some understanding of geo economics so how i should prepare myself and what are the uh, what are the opportunities uh, that you see for such people i think um, it's a fair question and unfortunately there are no degrees being given in geo economics even today 
yeah. it's a, it is an opportunity that is waiting to happen. It's a mm -hmm. most university and private enterprises and, and who might be listening. But short of that, and there weren't any when I started either. Mm -hmm. So um, for what it's worth, uh, I can tell you that my background is I'm an engineer in computer science and I have an degree in international finance and strategy. And, um, and I just made the best use of that uh, coming in, into geoeconomics. I will say that my MBA degree in interna and with a focus on finance, international finance, global macroeconomics really helped. That's what the underpinning. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, because there is no dedicated degree, uh, so uh, what are the degrees that I look for? In fact, I have, uh, I have uh, a job opening currently on the ORF website for your wow. audience. Uh, so you can look up what is it exactly that I, what I need. I had two job openings. One of them is one of them is has been fulfilled. The other one is still there. But as far as for students who want to do some homework, I think it's a it's an interesting job just just to see what is it exactly that we're looking for. But to answer the question directly, of course, the first thing is any degree in economics and finance and business is is very helpful because in the uh, in the end, economics whether you take international trade business national monetary system, banking system, or integration of all of these two, as I'm calling geoeconomics, and cross linkages, if you have to identify, you still need, you still, you need, uh, you need, you need a good understanding of finance and business and economics, your fundamentals need to be very, very clear. Mm. That's one way. A second degree, which has worked really well for me in the past, and uh, also hit some hires, but also I've seen my own field is is international law, but uh, focused on finance law or corporate law. Uh, so, if there are if there are law students and they can look at corporate law, that's a that's mm -hmm. a uh, degree as well because a lot of the inter what a lot of the economics is about looking at international agreements. It is looking about contracts between businesses. It is it is looking contracts between nations. It is looking about infrastructure financing deals between, say, World Bank and, like, say, the Tatas. You know, a lot of it is about being able to screen and understand uh, what is happening. And and I think an international law degree, uh, especially with with a focus on corporate law, and mm -hmm. thirdly is is an MBA with some focus on international finance or uh, global macroeconomics that would help too. So I would say in terms of uh, degrees, uh, that is the most uh, important. Of course, degrees is not everything. So I would add uh, two things because this conversation about what would prepare you would not be complete, especially yeah. in my field without yeah. saying these two other things. <clears throat> these two other things are reading and writing. Uh, I can guarantee that there is no way you can succeed at least in this field if you're not reading. And uh, I often find that to be one of the weakest links, especially amongst, amongst students who come fresh from universities. Uh, perhaps to give them the benefit of the doubt, the pressure on reading course material is quite a lot and there's preparation for exams. But those who can and those who have the ability, I would really encourage you to read a lot of books on international trade, international finance, banks, whoever you can get your hands on, if you think you know. and. It's okay to start with some of the popular names that you may know. Maybe start with Raghuram Rajan, start with people that you're familiar, whose work you're familiar with, or those who you see on TV, and then move on to more specific work. So reading is definitely one. And the second is writing. Uh, this one is, as a country, we are particularly bad. Uh, you know, we do not take enough time to learn writing. And uh, I, I think uh, what I see a lot of people face challenges in our interview process is that uh, they're very good when they are when they do their first round interviews and speaking and talking, their energy is coming through. Uh, the next step usually is to ask them for a writing sample or if I would just give them a topic to write on. And uh, I usually give them a time bound. I say one week, but time is important. But really, I could give them 10,000 words, but they would not really not be able to write 
a really good piece. And I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. that there's a habit of writing about complex issues of being able to communicate in one piece of paper, especially in public policy, that's very important. Yeah. Uh, the second part of your question is about where you can typically get your job. Of course, there are think tanks now. You can see that ORF actually has a dedicated program on geoeconomics. Um, it is uh, Samir Saran, who is the president of ORF. One of his uh, visions was to establish a program at ORF to mm -hmm. the BRICS and G20 and other multilateral uh, uh, arrangements that we have to discuss issues of global supply chains and how China and the US and everybody is coming together. So these are all issues. So obviously think tanks is, and I would say, I think uh, at this point, ORF, as of today, ORF is unique. I think we're the only ones that have a geoeconomics program. Of course, there are like <clears throat> uh, Indian Council for International Economic Research that have programs on international trade and international economics. As, uh, that should count as well. You have Center for WTO Studies, et cetera, who do trade-related work. They, they get a little bit more specific. Uh, the other option is, of course, corporate affairs or corporate strategy or um, the international division of, of multinationals. I think with kind of an understanding, uh, you know, if you're with Tata's or say if you're with a financial company and they want to go into, they want to invest in Sri Lanka, they want to invest in Africa, this kind of invest, uh, understanding will always have good, uh, will, will, lead, will put you in good uh, lead ahead of your other candidate. Risk consulting is a third one. There are very few companies there, but these will uh, respect and they are looking for people who can do risk consulting. And speaking of consulting, a fourth one is obviously the big four, Deloitte, PwC, KPMGs. They all have good uh, government practices, like a government divisions where they do a lot of, they're looking for people with some kind of international exposure. So I think these are the four or five places where uh, this kind of expertise would be of value. Uh, okay. I think there are people who are still on the lookout. I think you'll find jobs in this case. Yeah. Wonderful. So, uh, uh, because you were talking about books, uh, Akshay sir, so uh, two, three books that you would like to suggest to start with. Oh, um, maybe one I'll give you. Uh, I have, uh, I wish I had a copy here somewhere. It's called uh, War uh, by Other Means. It's by Robert Blackwell, Jennifer Harris of Council of Relations. Mm -hmm. And uh, it basically talks about all the other geoeconomic instruments and uh, through which a, a country, uh, how a country uses statecraft and diplomacy, how it deploys geoeconomic instruments towards an economic objective, like mm -hmm. getting ahead in trade or establishing rules of international banking system, et cetera. And they have given many so I would say, I would suggest that's a good place to start. There's another one also done with the Council on Foreign Relations, which is my personal favorite. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, uh, it's a book on uh, the Bretton Woods, uh, uh, written by Ben Steele, and I'm forgetting the name right now. It's here somewhere. If you'd asked me, I would have kept it on my desk. But I would suggest that that's another place for you to start. You can look mm -hmm. up, it's, it's by Ben Steele. It's, it's, it's on Bretton Woods institutions and how they were created. Okay. Um, and it's, it's a really good book to start. These two would, would give you a very solid foundation yeah. on, uh, on what geoeconomics is. I have, uh, uh, I can direct you to ORF Geoeconomics. You can read some articles there also to get some understanding. Definitely. One, of the, one of the first books that, um, you know, uh, that oh, I sorry, the name just know. came to me. Sorry, Bhavi. Yeah, Battle yes, yes, yes. Woods. Battle for Bretton Woods is the name for okay. Ben Steele. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Battle for Bretton Woods, uh, people. That's the book that you suggested. So, one of the first books that um, I read about international economics and financial uh, global system was Fault Lines by Raghuram Chirajan. Hmm. And the, the, the language was very easy, interesting. So, uh, that was probably the first book that I read about. Um, all these things. And la last question from my side, and then I would take some questions from audience. I've got four or five questions from audience. Uh, how does your day look like a as director of uh, ORF and as, as, as head of ORF who's head heading uh, geoeconomic session? So, so what all do you do in a day? How does your day look like? 
Well, I can tell just you so that uh, we can just just so that we can understand that one. If if we want to make career in this this particular field, what well, I'll we tell have? you. I can tell you that I have a dual role at uh, at at ORF, uh, yes. and that is evident. Hopefully, evident from my designation. Uh, I'm yes. the director of ORF Mumbai, and uh, as well as head of the ORF Geoeconomics program. So. You, some of your uh, audience members may know that ORF is a large organization, 150 plus. It's based out of, uh, I mean, it's led out of Delhi, which is where our president and our chairperson sits, and that's where the largest number of team members are. But we also have centers. We have a center in Mumbai, which is the se second largest. We have a center in, in Kolkata. Uh, we have an outpost in Chennai. We've just recently launched a, a center in Washington, D.C. called ORF Americas. And so we have many centers. So I'm responsible for, uh, for ORF Mumbai. We have 23 people, uh, 23 people staff, and we have experts in, uh, we have a couple of experts in geoeconomics, obviously, but we have studies, security, digital governance, urban policy. Urban policy is actually one of our flagship programs out of uh, Mumbai, and uh, development finance. And so, uh, that's my that's my primary role to oversee what is happening at War Mumbai, our staff, uh, management issues, um, which also includes uh, uh, looking at both hiring, fundraising, uh, yeah. uh, all of those things. And my second part of the role is what we've spoken about so far, which is the geoeconomics program. There, I'm more the thematic head. But there, uh, I'm the head of the geoeconomics program across all the centers. So I, I look, look upon and draw upon and hopefully try to support my colleagues in Delhi and Calcutta and DC uh, to work on these issues together on geoeconomics. And so we're, so, you know, they might be like, say, an expert in, uh, in uh, digitalization, digital governance, not necessarily geoeconomics, but they, maybe they're doing something on multinationals, like taxation of multinationals. So I would work with that colleague on geoeconomics. I provide my input. So, uh, so that's the second part of my role. So uh, my day, I would say, is evenly split between these these two things. Uh, um, and uh, I would say that uh, my best part of my day is I try to get up early because I need to catch up on reading. <laughs> so uh, I try to get one or two hours of reading before uh, eight a.m. Okay. So you 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 remember a five a.m. club kind of thing, but <laughs> uh, yes, I I uh, well let's keep it six a.m. I five a.m. Okay. lunch days, but certainly between six a.m. and eight a.m. certainly I get I get some time. All right, all right, all right. So uh, uh, Akshay, so now let me take questions from our audience. The first question that I have is: uh, Is it better to fight on a battlefield with conventional weaponry? or to wage a battle based on expertise in economics? So uh, that, that's one question that I, that I received. So modern warfare. No, I mean, yeah, and I'm not an expert in modern warfare, but I can certainly give you a, um, a perspective coming from geoeconomics since this session is on geoeconomics. So the idea of geoeconomics is not to replace geopolitics. And so geopolitics stays, it's very much there. International security considerations are very much there. Uh, when there are, when there is piracy attacks in off the coast of Somalia, uh, when our troops are on Ladakh border, uh, when uh, certain uh, anti-terror, anti-counterinsurgency operations have to take place, you can't always make an argument that, you know, we need to put a geoeconomic strategy or a security strategy. So it's, it's not possible. It is not the way the world works. It is not certainly suggested. Uh, what, uh, so geopolitics and geoeconomics in some ways they go together and we have to look at what, what how can geoeconomics and geopolitics at the end of the day support your diplomacy and your overall national objectives. So one of the most, one of the most frequently used geoeconomic instruments when it comes to this kind of warfare is maybe say sanctions, right? So yeah. uh, maybe you, you're not going to war, but you deploy sanctions. You, you sanction the technology companies in that other country, defense companies, defense contractors. And so maybe that's an approach that has worked. It has worked certainly in some cases, in some cases less so. 
Uh, and the United States does it all the time. The European Union does it all the time. They impose sanctions on Iran, on Myanmar. And so, so that's an example of a geoeconomic instrument. But certainly it's not an either or. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think we have, um, though we have already spoken about it uh, in very brief, but there is another question which says, that, uh, is geoeconomics part of geopolitics or it is bigger than that? Can it be seen in isolation? The no. is, is, it can, yeah, it can't be seen in isolation as I was just saying. Uh, it is yeah. not part of geopolitics either. Um, these, these need to be looked at as, um, as complementary uh, to each other. In fact, uh, for those who are interested, you might want to go to uh, read this original article by Edward uh, Lutwak in the 1970s, because he's credited with uh, first coining the term geoeconomics. And uh, you know, when he coined the term, his basic message was that the battle is now moving from more military and territorial uh, objectives to more economic means and economic objectives. And that was the fundamental shift that Lutwak brought to the table to say that that kind of militaristic territorial, this thing is over. I think it's more about economics. Some may even argue that economics is over now, it's digital and artificial intelligence, uh, you know, which will take away. And that's a separate discussion to be had. But certainly geoeconomics need to be seen in conjunction with geopolitics. We're not, uh, not separately. Another question that comes from audience is, uh, uh, how geoeconomics is playing a role in achieving uh, SDGs? So there are many aspects of geoeconomics that have to do with SDGs, right? Uh, SDGs by themselves don't fall into geoeconomics. In fact, actually, uh, if you look at the sustainable De development goals and look at all 17 goals, uh, you might just find one goal out of those 17, which you might think is related to maybe private investment and finance and trade. But you know, the others are life above water, life below water, clean air, and it is about gender. Sustainable development goals is, is, is much has a much larger it is about a much larger socio-economic social development objective the perhaps the only element of geoeconomics there something that i have tracked is how financing is helping or can help support the sdg goals and there there is certainly some geoeconomics involved because the financing that is coming to sustainable development goals is not uh, not enough and sometimes there is many a times there is a lot of politics there's a, there's a lot of geoeconomics involved either there are developed countries that are not letting that kind of capital flow easily there are in their regulatory concerns on why it's not flowing to the right places uh, maybe we are constrained by by technology whose ipr we do not have like solar panels or batteries or something. So those are all dimensions of geoeconomics as they relate to SDGs. But um, there's somewhat parallel tracks and you have to look uh, where the geoeconomics is having, is having its, uh, is, is influencing the achievement of SDGs and financing and IPR and supply chain are actually some of the touch points. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, um, one more question is, uh, uh, what major changes do you see in geoeconomics post uh, this breakout of pandemic? Look, one of the things that is happening already uh, is that uh, we, um, the IMF and the, and the G20 countries are now renegotiating. First of all, they're negotiating a global framework for bailing out the countries that are that are most at risk, especially those countries where they're not being able to pay back foreign debt, those who need help, fiscal help, monetary help from the IMF, etc. So the so we so really the world is actually in crisis management mode, maybe a little bit like the transatlantic financial crisis of 2009-10, or the crisis that have come before that, where the countries got together to create a rescue package. So at the moment for geoeconomics, that is the most 
uh, important thing that we are following on our dashboard. And the reason mm -hmm. it is really important is because each country is using its statecraft and diplomacy to, to influence what global and common framework will look like. Should the world come up with standards? Who should we help? How much should the help be? What the rescue package should look like? Um, what do we do about private uh, creditors? You know, maybe we can, okay, maybe the, the G20 have come up with a decision saying, let's all, uh, let, let the nations all decide that we will, uh, you know, we will, we will hold the payments that are due to us. But what happens to private creditors? What happens to the money that nations owe to private creditors? How are we going to convince the private creditors to, to also hold? So there's all these discussions that are taking place in, in geoeconomics. So I see that as a fundamental uh, uh, thing on our dashboard. And the second is global supply chains. You know, as if politics and security was not enough to fragment globalization, there's now also post COVID economic recovery. You know, we are, the world has become suddenly very, very, uh, very careful and uh, and uh, and very cautious about putting all the eggs in one basket which is having all the supply chains towards one region or one country so diversification of supply chains some of your audience members may have noted that you know india dependent on china for such a large part of the uh, pharmaceutical raw materials uh, you know actually the rest of the world did as well Today, if you look at the electronic supply chain, so much of it comes from East Asia between Taiwan and Japan and Korea and this thing. Uh, that story repeats itself for many such sectors. So I think supply chains is, is the second on our dashboard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So um, uh, at the end of the call, there is one more. It's a very cute question. So we have answered it. Uh, a quick, uh, a very cute question, and then uh, one more question. I think we have already answered that question before. Is uh, but still, I would repeat it because the audience has posted it. So, uh, are there any internship opportunities available uh, in geoeconomics? That's one question. And another, if you could name some more organizations like uh, ORF that are working in the area of geoeconomics. So, is, are there any internship opportunities? So, yes, so so there are internships. Uh, I think uh, what what happens with uh, ORF and particularly for ORF Mumbai is that there's a rolling internship uh, uh, cycle. It's not like we have a three month cycle in the summers only. We keep getting uh, uh, resumes uh, in. Um, the, I, I think uh, as far as the website goes, we don't particularly advertise that we're looking for a geoeconomics uh, internship. There are many reasons for that because uh, we're actually looking for internship across all the sectors. There's nuclear, financial security, there's military, there's sustainable development goals, climate change, development finance, blue economy. So, so, so we don't we don't advertise it per program. But uh, I can tell you that a lot of those internship uh, requests come through my desk and uh, we're always looking. I actually have two interns right now that are working in geoeconomics. Uh, what tends to happen is that those resumes with a good international finance or economics background, those that look convincing certainly will come to me. And uh, I pay I pay particular attention. Let's just say I pay particular attention to those that are floating in. So, but I want everybody to know that every single resume that is sent in is looked at very carefully. I know sometimes uh, that it can be frustrating when you don't hear back because we get so many and we don't have a, uh, a very formal system set up to respond back to every single resume that has been sent in, and also with an explanation on why. It was but certainly it is, it is archived and it is with me and we go through every single resume. So if the resume stands out, you'll hear from us for sure. Um, on the list of companies, I, uh, list of think tanks, I think I gave you a couple of examples. There is uh, ICREA, which is based in Delhi, Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations. There is the Center for WTO Studies, which is based at uh, IIFT, Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. There is Center for uh, Foreign Trade, I think it's CFT, that is based uh, in uh, under Ministry of Commerce. 
There is NIPFP National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, which is done, which is run by Ministry of Finance. Um, yeah, I mean, those are some of the think tanks, uh, I would say, uh, that are working on it. There's also, if you have specific aspects, like if you want to look at energy, geoeconomics, energy economics, you can look at Terry. They're doing some work. So there are opportunities out there. Wonderful. So uh, just to wrap up this conversation, uh, 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 this entire conversation reminded me of uh, a statement that my professor, uh, you know, he mentioned it in one of my classes when I was pursuing my MBA, it was a class of international business, where uh, we were talking about globalization. And he, he said that the, uh, the, the gainers of the globalization need to share their gains with the losers of the globalization to make this whole system work. Do you see that happening now? Um, this is a really good time to ask that question and really bad time to answer that question because inequality, if anything, actually has sharpened acutely in this COVID-19 pandemic. So if they, even for those who make an argument about globalization, I think even the best of arguments require some uh, introspection on mm -hmm. it and what we need to do locally versus what all the benefits that can come to us with global integration, right? Mm -hmm. And so, while I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not like speaking for a political party, but definitely some of the production-linked incentives, this Atmanirbhar Bharat, uh, this reflection and this introspection on what we can produce in India is certainly gaining steam, you know, mm. and. Um, and I think uh, I think more and more people will realize that perhaps we need like a different version, a slightly more refined version of globalization to make it work for everybody. And I think those con but those conversations are taking place. They're smart people. Those conversations are taking place. There's an acute there's an, there's a very good understanding that it may not be to everybody that we need. And so we're trying to see uh, what can be done. You see, because there are areas of globalization that have worked really, really well. We have over 20 unicorns in India. We have a startups in Bangalore and Hyderabad. You know, we have a range of industries that are growing across the country. So we don't want to uh, take a, uh, some, some kind of a dogmatic approach towards globalization, uh, saying that it's not working or not working. I think we need to take specific aspects which are not working and, and try and treat them. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Akshay, Akshay sir, for uh, joining us at this uh, conversation. Just all dialogue, the entire team, all the viewers, we would like to thank you for giving us uh, such wonderful insights into uh, geoeconomics, explaining the foundations of geoeconomics to us and sharing some wonderful opportunities with uh, all of us. It was really nice talking to you, very insightful. And uh, we would definitely definitely like to do uh, an advanced conversation around geoeconomics to understand specific issues uh, uh, relating to geopolitics and geoeconomics. Thank you so much, Akshay, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sony. You were very kind with your questions. And I would welcome once the world opens up again and we are back in our physical offices and uh, I'd welcome your team uh, and any students to come and visit us at WARF Mumbai uh, and maybe we can host a discussion there. So, Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for watching and uh, uh, thanks from the team of Jasol. Thank you.